Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today we are in Prescott, Arizona and we are going to the Museum of Indigenous People. This is about to be a great stop and so this is going to be a great way for us to explore Arizona past. Let's go. Okay, adventurers, let's get to talking about the history of this place, and then we're gonna go and look around some of the amazing things that we can find here. First and foremost, whenever I checked in, it was $10 for a regular adult. However, they do have senior and military discounts, as well as discounts for those who are indigenous, which I think is great. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to come here was because this museum is actually specifically dedicated to the indigenous people of this area. Some of the other museums in this area will tap on that just a little bit, but this really focuses and dives in on the artifacts that have been found and also some of the really cool history here. In fact, this museum was responsible for saving rodeos in Prescott. Believe it or not, at one point in time, this was put into place as a fundraiser to help save the rodeo tradition here. And so I thought that that was pretty cool. But also, the Smokey people, the Smokey people were really actively participating in this exhibit. And in fact, you'll find a lot of artifacts here that have come from archaeologists who have worked hand in hand with those indigenous people to share their voices. And I think that that is amazing. In a world where we tend to share the narratives of others, them sharing their own narrative and their own conversation, so important. So with that said, let's take a walk around and then we'll look at some of the signage that's here and learn a little bit more as we get some brain wrinkles. Let me just start out by saying this place is one that you need to put on your Prescott bucket list because they do have a lot of historic paintings here. In fact, they have the largest single collection by one particular artist, in fact, responsible for this painting right here. And there is a sign right here for us to learn a bit more about her. So let's start our tour right here. And her name is Kate Thompson Corey. Now, Kate Thompson Corey was originally from just outside of the Chicago area, and she wanted to move to this area as a result of wanting to start an art commune with a friend. Well, the friend never showed up, and Kate ended up spending a lot of time here with the Hopi people, and she documented their lives through her art and photography. And here you can find a massive collection of her artwork. Just to kind of give you an idea of how astonishing her artwork happens to be, it's featured in every top indigenous gallery that you will find. Her contributions have also been acknowledged on a national scale in many locations because of her attention to detail in sharing the experience of what it was like to be a part of these villages. She learned the language, she integrated into their lives and became one with the people. And there was a very large respect between the two. And so here we can find not only the largest collection but a bit more information about her and her views of what it was like to be a part of this. So I think that that's pretty cool, but there's so much more to this. So let's keep exploring. Here we see a display of the Anasazi of the Southwest. This was between 1100 and 1250 AD. And you can see the cliff dwellings, very similar to those that we have seen in the Mesa Verde area, where the recess of the cliff face would provide shelter for them to create a lifestyle that was safe from the outside world during the elements. Also recorded in this area are some petroglyphs and some focus on some of the earliest of animals. In fact, here you can find information about bison and what the native cultures might have done with some of the items from the bison. Remember, a lot of places that we have gone previous kind of tie everything together and share that every piece of a bison was used from the bone and the teeth to the fur, to the bladder, each piece had a value. And here we can see some of those in this particular viewing area. But something else that's pretty cool, this right here, a Colombian mammoth hair that's actually on loan 
by Foothill College. And you can see as we get a little closer on this, how fine the hair actually is. Interesting thing is, through time we have found that man coexisted with great beasts, and at some points people have perceived that they might have existed in this region with saber-toothed tigers or mammoths. So finding pieces of those particular items is really fascinating and not something that you get to do very often, finding a fibrous hair. That is amazing. In fact, I haven't seen one of those at any of the other displays we've been at. But in addition to the hair, we find the teeth of the woolly mammoth that have been found in this region. We find some various points that have been found in this region that were fashioned right here in our own backyard. And there's so much interesting history just in this one corner. But then we move into a few more of the dioramas, which would explain how life might have looked way back when. In fact, there's a few more cliff dwellings, and then also there is a village. I'm going to show you these a little bit closer so you can perceive what it might have been like to live at that time. Now, while I do this, I want you to envision what you would be doing if you lived in a place like this. How would your life be different than it is right now? What would life have been like when it came to getting food, when it came to taking a bath? What would it have been like when it comes to using the restroom even? common things that we do every day that we take for granted. What would it have been like in these indigenous villages? In fact, right here we can still go and look at this cliff dwelling. This is the Montezuma Castle and it is located approximately 27 miles north of Cordes Junction and this is considered to be an ancient ruin. Now this particular structure was considered to be five stories tall and had 20 rooms which could facilitate up to 50 people living in this one quarters. It was precariously located on the side of a mountain and you can see how the cliff face really provided the shelter for the overall construction and also the little crevices that are kind of into the side of the cliff you could see they could use for storage. Now getting to this was not easy. They had to use these elaborate ladders in order to climb up, up, and up. So you couldn't be afraid of heights in order to live here, that's for sure. Things were definitely different then. But this provided them shelter from a lot of the elements, including the blistering heat, the sands, the snows, the rain. Here we have another petroglyph, and this is actually a sandstone slab that has the glyphs etched into them on the surface. Now it's interesting to see that as you travel from one place to the next, some of the symbols are very interestingly common. In fact, the swirly sign that looks almost like a spiral, that's very common in the southwest we learned. However, a lot of the petroglyphs still remain a mystery because they could have meant a lot of different things. But here at the museum, you have a couple of good examples of petroglyphs in this corner right here, right next to Montezuma's castle. Now here we find a piece that is actually by a native artist and it is called the Dance of the Nightway Ceremony. It's painted wood, yarn, metal, and it was by an artist named Klitso Deadman who was alive between 1879 and 1953. It says that he was actually born in the Chinle area and went to Grand Junction Indian School and he was considered unusual because he was fluent in English but could also read and write. He worked for the Santa Fe Railway as a stonemason before converting to Catholicism, marrying and running his own trading post. Now often we talk about the craftsmanship of of the indigenous people and the various things that they have created throughout time. Here we found a Navajo wedding basket, but along with that it actually tells you a bit more about what the basket teaches through the patterns that they use. For example, there is one section that says that the outer ring actually represents the human race. And then as you get into each layer, it goes through cloud layers and protection and usually there are six representations of protection on the sacred mountains but the mountains themselves which are the peaks actually vary from basket to basket and that tells the story so even in something as humble as a basket there is a story which can be told through symbolism that also goes for the items like this the elaborate weavings now down below we actually see how the weavings are created using this style of loom right here it's a hand loom. They actually would wind the pieces onto 
this little spool and then they would integrate them in one line at a time. This was a very tedious process and in typical villages this would be something that would be very commonplace. They would use these not only in the village however but also as trade goods. But something else that I thought was really interesting is this right here. How many times have you been to a place and you've seen an ornate or beautiful piece of silver work that contains turquoise? Well, silversmithing is actually quite a popular trend that has occurred throughout the Navajo people especially. And so here we have a Navajo display of a silversmith and you can see how they would create the form for which to pour the metal in and also how they could place the stones. It's fascinating to be able to see up close just how that they would do this and the tools that they would use. And this is one of the only places that I've seen that has focused on this particular skill set also and I think that that is incredible. Now there's a lot that we can say about this particular display, but I wanted to start with the sacred colors of the Apache that are all represented here. In fact, each of the sacred colors indicates a direction. For example, black is considered to be east, green or blue is south, yellow is west, and white is north. And you can see how each one of those colors is represented in these figurines. But these figurines also depict mountain spirit dancers. Now, believe it or not, each of these dancers signifies a certain part of a ceremony that was performed early on. But in the 1900s, the United States banned them from doing these kind of ceremonies because they felt that they just didn't align with the values of the country because they didn't understand what exactly that they were doing and they didn't want them to be able to worship and have their freedom of religion. Well, guess what, guys? That got overturned. And once again, the Religious Freedom Act ensured that the indigenous people could perform their ceremonies in the fashion of their personal religion because we all have freedom of religion. It's not just one denomination. It's not just one kind. And I think that that is a bigger story that we'll tackle on a different day. But I found it was very interesting that it's featured here because so many times we overlook that particular fact of this is their religion. This is how they worship and it is to be respected. You know, the interesting thing that I've learned at traveling across the country for six years is how often that places will interpret things as opposed to reading it for face value. And one of the founding principles for our nation was that we could practice our religious freedom. And so I think it's really good that that was tackled right there, but we have a lot of museum to go, so let's keep moving. Here is a beaded buckskin pouch, and this actually represented through the symbolism on the front here, the road to the new world and crossing signifying the sun. And the crescent and the moon are all represented in here too. In the back, this elaborate beadwork belongs to a tea necklace. Necklaces of this style were worn with the puberty right dress. Again, in this area, we find more of the elaborate baskets. And remember what we just learned, each basket pattern is significant of something around in nature and also based on what it is used for. So like this one right here is called the White Mountain Basket. And it says that the motif patterns that we're seeing going down the side are usually a traditional nature print that was used and they represent also the four seasons and the cardinal directions which I think is pretty neat but then we also see these larger ones that have a very different print like this one which has in red and black design and it was painted onto the exterior and this one was made for gathering things and you could see this typically either slung on the back or it was worn across the forehead with a strap now this is called a pitched jar it was a jar that was made impermeable with a paste of ground juniper leaves that were pressed into the weaving itself and then boiled pinion pitch into the surface. And so it's kind of interesting to see that this would be something that would be watertight where they could actually carry water back and forth or keep water into the village itself. In this corner we have moccasins that were actually made out of buckskin and they were worn by the smoke eye and they used them during their dance performances. Speaking of which, those dance performances were 
here in Prescott all the way up until the 1990s as a part of this museum. Right below that, we have an otter skin that was used to carry arrows. They used every piece of the animal and it was important for them to do so because they did not want to waste what had been sent to them. And so here you would find that they would use the pelt itself for one thing and all of the bones, but then they would tan the actual skin to be able to use it for carrying pouches. Now just to kind of give you context as to what has happened to the indigenous people. This was formerly the Apache land and this spanned over both Arizona and New Mexico. However, this is the same Apache land today and you will notice that it is now isolated into tiny patches and they are no longer able to be nomadic because these are the reservations that they were told to stay on whenever they were moved off of the land so that others could move in. Now so often we have talked about how people were moved under reservations, but we haven't really covered as much of that here in Arizona with the exception of little pieces here and there. So that visual was super important to kind of convey to you guys just how big of a deal this was. These were free roaming people who would move with the weather. They would move seasonally so that they could have the best opportunity to have food and water. And then they were isolated to these sections and said that they were sovereign, but given no supplies to do so. So it made life much harder, not to mention the influx of people meant the influx of disease and again without any kind of resources this ravaged the people and so it's very important to see visuals like this even though sometimes they're a little bit harder to see because the impact that people have had on others is kind of harsh but at the same time brain wrinkles will lead us to do better things in the future. Here we find a collection of baskets from the Pima and these are a different series and as you can see different color patterns and also different designs. Now one of the ones that is marked is this tall basket which is considered to be an unusual basket which seems to have a very unique pattern of people on it and it says here that it looks as though there is a line of men that's holding hands but one of them is actually missing a leg and that's the one that we can see right here on the bottom and in the upper design it's all women and they're in different dresses and they're holding different kinds of farm tools including like rakes and hoes which is pretty interesting now the base of this one is actually a choya and we've been seeing those throughout the desert but this is a piece of art that is put together to show what life would have been like and you can see here two different depictions of life on the uh, open plains. This one right here, she's actually holding a basket that is fashioned and again strapped across her forehead and it's holding squash and corn. And I have to say guys, that's not light stuff. So this was a hard work of labor to go and harvest and move things for sure. This one is actually a friendship dance pot and the elaborate design here is beautiful. You can see the attention to the detail of the coloration, the tiny lines, the individual pieces, and also as you kind of swirl around here you can see various animals that would have been on the plains at the time. Now the neat thing about seeing all the baskets is there's actually some information here that basket making is one of the earliest discovered longest standing things that they have been able to find. In fact they have found things that have dated back as far as 7,000 B see and that is crazy to see that there's still a record of people that have lived that much more before us through the things that they have created but being able to see how they create it what it means to them and why that we should be learning from that is even more fascinating and this is a great resource for doing so so let's keep going basket making techniques might have included some items that look like this and you've probably seen several of these items just thinking that they were absolutely nothing. However, they turned them into something and I think that that's what's the most important thing is being able to see the vision beyond just the items. For example, here is a piece that they would use to punch holes in coils and then they would use willow twigs and they would peel them to warp them. They would also use cottonwood for coiling and then they would use these little devil's claws which how many of us have gotten one of those stuck on our shoe while we're out on a hike? A lot of us. Believe it or not though that could have been used at one point in time to make a basket that looks like this. It's pretty amazing to see how little that it would have taken to make some of these elaborate pieces but also how hard it would have been to manipulate these items 
to do this. In fact, whenever we see things in those contexts, we respect them more and realize just how much it took to have very common things. Now, if we want to go get a basket, we just go to like a Pier 1 and just say, okay, I want this one and take it home with us. Or we go to like a container store or a, a store that you can go find furnishings and it's no work on us whatsoever except for the gas to get there. However, everything that they had at this time, they had to envision and then execute through hand. It was all by hand. It was not an easy life to live at that time. And so life was very, very different. And so it's important for us to respect that as we come into places like this. And again, take a step back like I challenged you to do and see what you would have been good at. What would your skills have been? What would you contribute to the greater good of the tribe? The tribe was a unit. It wasn't all the division that we have today because a single tribe had to coexist in order to make things work. So I think that that's really important. But there's some more cool things is here that I want to touch on. Now, believe it or not, this piece right here was actually found by a geocacher. We like to go geocaching and we're always finding interesting things, but never have I ever found anything quite this interesting. This was found in a rock crevice near Pine Mountain Wilderness, and it was one of the few whole examples of this type that has been known. And so this is such an amazing find. This is actually a potable jar that could be used and it was pre 1300s. Now this section is called native voice. And I think that this is very interesting because it says here that the native voice is as old as time itself and expressions of passion for life ways and the world and the people have always been present. And so as we go through this section, we will see a reflection of just some of those native voices. The interesting thing about this particular section is it says the museum actually encourages people to use their voice to stand up for the things that they believe in. And so activism is a big thing here because indigenous voices need to be heard. So through these pieces, we will see some of those voices and hear them and share them. And we will raise them up like they should be done. And I think that this is gonna be a great way for us to see an insight as to indigenous voices today. As we get started, these are some of the featured artists and additional artworks. These are also some of the staff members and volunteers that are responsible for this. And to these people, I would like to say thank you. Now we start right here with the Dragon of Mississippi, and there's actually a brochure which tells us a bit more about this. And this is something that I'm going to leave for you all to read a bit more because I think it's worth a deep dive for sure. But now this is actually what this was kind of inspired by. This is from 1962. It was the last historical photo of this painting and it was located in a very interesting place along a wall. And this is a recreation, mixed media art version of what we have found. And this is a beautiful piece that is front and center as soon as you come in the door. It is definitely a profound voice. This one is called Military Service and it is by Karen Clarkson and she is a Choctaw. As we get closer you can see a little bit more closely the detail and definition of each and every one of these. It's a painting that shows the original code talkers. Now interesting story about this. Did you know that all Native American men were required to sign up to go to war but they weren't even granted citizenship until 1924. That is wild. We'd been here for all this time and wouldn't even acknowledge the people that were of this country as people of this country officially. Now, at one point, speaking the native language of your people was considered to be wrong in this country. In fact, to some extent, it still is by many. However, one of the things that was interesting about the code talkers was the very same men who were criticized for using their voices while talking to one another after having to be enlisted were also turned to as a result of needing a special something to help our country get ahead. So they used their native language to help us form a code that proved to be instrumental in making a huge impact in the war. Just going to show that sometimes even though we might not necessarily understand or even agree with 
it doesn't make it wrong. And in fact, if we learn from one another instead of criticizing one another, we could probably gain a lot. And so I love places like this that tell us a little bit more about the pieces of history that interconnect, because even though this is just a small painting, it tells a huge story. Now in this section, we talk about humanity. And there are a few pieces here that I wanted to highlight that might be a little bit hard to see, but at the same time, I think they're very important. For example, this piece right here that says the Indian School Journal from 1925. We learned that Native children actually were painted standing next to the cover of this particular periodical because many of the children's deaths at this time were actually attributed to tuberculosis as a result of being housed in these schools in unhealthy conditions. Not to mention over 18,000 students attended these schools between 1884 and 1980. In fact, these places were open until the 80s, guys. A lot of us don't realize that. Half of those children came from the Cherokee, Choctaw, Navajo, and Creek nations. Now, in more recent years, we have found that many of these schools also treated children poorly and abused them. And they treated them very badly to the extent of if they were ill, they would just disregard them and in many of these school areas they've actually found mass graves of children families who were never reconnected to their kids and it was all because the government or religion stepped in and thought that they were bad because they were different and they needed to control them so things like this need to be talked about more and I'm glad that they're talking about them here at the Museum for Indigenous People now this is kind of neat. During the 22-23 season for the Phoenix Suns, they acknowledged the 22 federally recognized tribal nations. And this is a jersey that was actually to commemorate that, that was born at the Phoenix Suns games. And I think that this is just really neat. And in fact, it goes on to explain the display here. And it says that it uses symbolic elements of the indigenous culture. The turquoise color actually represents the precious living nature of earth and its protection. The stripes bear the word for sun in each of the tribe's traditional native languages. And I think that that's pretty neat also. But then it goes on to say that the logo actually reflects the medicine wheel and has the four cardinal directions. And it is surrounded by 22 feathers on the other side. Guys, what the suns are doing, that's called cultural appreciation, not appropriation. Which is another thing that I think we could talk about here. I think a lot of times whenever we go to places and we see something that is inspired by. Sometimes people take credit for that inspiration instead of, you know, just saying, hey, I learned about this through. And so I think it's really important for us to collaborate with as opposed to taking credit for. And so that is a great way to do it right there. Now in this section, this is called Mother Earth. And I really like a few of these also. So let's look at a couple. For example, this one right here, this is actually called Land Back, and it was inspired by a creator who is Cheyenne River Sioux, and it says, speaking with the land is a puzzle, colonialism scattered across generations. I want the land back, yes, but even more, I want the land to want me back. Each other's missing piece, our jigsaw edges fit together, long awaited embrace. And that is definitely something that is very true for most indigenous people. They want to have the understanding, and I think that through pieces like this, it really expresses that. Now, I don't believe there is one answer to solve all the world's problems by any means, but I think that if we listen to the voices who are talking on both sides, as opposed to talking over one another, we tend to get closer to a resolution. And so seeing things like this, which talk about the activism and hearing each other out all the way through, as opposed to crowding over with additional noise, is the first step. So I really appreciate this gallery, but we have a lot more to go, and there's actually a section back here that's designed for for the kiddos, so let's go in there next. Now in this section, you can get really hands-on, and I think you can see this is a fun place for the kiddos. It's a learning lab where everything is able to be touched, as opposed to the cases which you're not allowed to touch. So here you can learn a bit more about the various aspects of the culture through things that you can physically hold, which really appeals to a lot of different learning styles. But also, you can get in here and get a little bit creative by designing your own medicine wheel or coloring one of the coloring sheets. But while you're doing that, you can learn more about this and why it's important. 
For example, whenever I was way over in Arkansas and I was on a spot along the Trail of Tears, there's actually a wheel that you can find where the plants are planted according to a design. And it goes along the concept of the medicine wheel. And all of those plants inside of that could be used for medicinal purposes. And I just thought that that was really neat. But understanding the different colors, understanding the placement, understanding their relation to the rising and falling of the sun. All of those are things that you can learn right here in this little learning section and I love that. You also can learn about corn and why corn is such a part of history and also still remains something that we need to know more about today. For example, down here on this bottom line you can see this is popcorn, this is flint, this is flour, this is sweet, and that's dent. Each one of these has a very different use and along the way you can see what each one of those uses are and why you would need all of those. The crazy thing is, a lot of us just see corn as corn, but the corn that you feed your cattle might not be the same corn that you would use in your home, or the corn that you're using toward fuel, which they use in gas, is not gonna be the same as that you're popping at the, the movies. It's gonna be very different, and this explains why, and also how each one is grown. But then right below this, we have some different grinding stations where you can get hands-on and see what it would have been like to actually have to grind that corn and turn it into meal. And it wasn't an easy job and it wasn't something that was super fast. So I think this is great because it puts into perspective not only the act of growing, but also what you would have to do with it after and what that would take to do it. So again, you can envision yourself in that spot and think, wow, I sure am appreciative for a grocery store right now. Additionally, in this section, you have some really great murals, which also continue to tell the story. And I think that that's great, including this one with the corn over here. It shows you what growing on the mesa might have looked like. But then there's this one little display in the back that I really liked. It's just very small, but it tells you how they would have come up with all of the colors that you see in the different items that we were just looking at. They had to use plants in order to create a dye and the dye would have been used on each of the fibrous materials and then it would have been able to be used in the weaving or looming process. Again, just echoing, you can't go to Hobby Lobby, you can't go to Michael's, you have to do it all from scratch, from the getting of the material to the dyeing of the material to the weaving of the material to the selling of the items if you're selling it or to the using. And again, long process to do small things. Now just below that I found this that says open me, everything in here is meant to be examined closely. So here we find a drawer filled with kachinas and you can pick up each one of these kachinas and see the detail and learn a little bit more about what the process would have been to create these through visually seeing it. Each one of these would have been intricately designed and each piece has a symbolism, which we're gonna learn a little bit more about in just a moment when we go to our Kachina display. But this is a good way for the kids to get to see it, touch it, hold it, and also kind of envision playing with it or even learn what this guy might have been symbolically. Now we just learned through the basketball jersey that there are 22 separate nations here in Arizona. And on this you can see exactly where each one of them currently resides and where they call home. In fact, in this region right here, which would be the area that we've been exploring a lot, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different nations just right in here. That is insane. But you can learn a little bit more about them by grabbing their name and then going into the other area of the museum and finding pieces of their culture throughout. Now we started off this display talking about Kate Corey and here we learn a bit more about her and this is the interesting thing that I really wanted to dive into and show you. Her photographs were well known as she documented the people. And you can see in one of these publications some of those photos, but also Kate herself. But there's a few other things in here that I thought were very interesting, including a self and studio right here. This was in 1912. She actually came here in 1912 and 
She wanted to learn to weave, but she had never woven a blanket, so she learned to do so as the people of the area actually instructed her, and she formed this well-noted friendship with them. And because of that, there was a trust and a companionship. So here you can see that documented throughout and learn a bit more about her outstanding life. She has an amazing story to tell. And realistically, we should all be a bit more like Kate. As we talked about going through and finding the various cultures and the various tribes, here we have some of the Hopi works. And you can find, again, various designs that are very different. These are more in a black and white style. And this first one here on the left is called Frog Woman. And this was something that I thought was really neat because of the design itself. But each of these intricate designs tells a very different story from the last. And I think that's really cool. And as we move down here, here we see even more of those and we learn a bit more about the polychrome and then also the black and yellow tones that they would use as well. Now in traveling I have seen something similar to these but not exactly. These are the owls that were a traditional Zuni design and it says here that owls actually helped them fight wars long ago and so they were very symbolic and you can see that reflected through their appreciation of the species of owls right here. Each feather, each piece, even the beaks very defined here we have another touch area and it says please touch hands-on area and it shows you some of the weapons and tools that they would have used and tells you a bit more about them in fact we see a replica arrow here we also see an atlatl and then there's also a bow and so all of these things you can touch you can pick up you can feel and you can again envision the people who would have been using these now when we were in phoenix we did see a little bit of hohokam works but um here we see even more and you can see the consistencies of the patterns that are used this one of course using that swirling pattern that we talked about earlier but also the difference in coloration of materials and how they would have created these would have been slightly different than some of the other tribes. It's kind of interesting to see how throughout time the pottery changed. And here you can literally walk through time and see a massive amount of knowledge just through the colors, the styles, and also the individual tribes. Everywhere I go, there's little touch areas, and I really appreciate that because a lot of times at history museums, it's harder for people to relate to something that was so far back. But whenever we see it, we touch it, we feel it, or we hear it, we get to connect with it. And so here, once again, you can have that option to do so and see what it would have been like with this item or even the maze back here. Now, this is kind of a neat collection right here because notice that they have an entire series of these, and they all look like they're made out of bones and so we're seeing how bones could be used for a variety of different things throughout the museum it goes without saying as we go from case to case we see more and more of those items that have been used and repurposed from single individual creatures they really did not believe in wasting anything again because they felt as though if it was brought to them they needed to use it because it was a blessing and so every single item even the brain was used in fact fact, I did not know the brain was actually used a lot of times in the tanning process. And that can be seen some of the items that might have been tanned throughout these two displays right here. In fact, I'm going to show you a few more items just up close, and then I'm going to get up to a case that I just saw that kind of takes us back to those code talkers. Their contributions to our country went above and beyond. And because of them, we were able to do so many things that otherwise wouldn't have been an option. And that helped in the war effort. And despite the fact that at one point they were ridiculed for their language, their language is beautiful. And it actually did bridge a large gap in something that we needed. So thank you to those people, but also all of those who served from this region. Thank you, indigenous warriors. We appreciate you. Now I learned from a display in Oklahoma and another one just right here in Arizona about many of the different people and gods that were portrayed through these individual, what look like fun, bright, colored statues. 
But there's a little bit more here that I want to share with you. Here you will find the information that tells us a bit more about how that they would define these particular items. And it also tells you a little bit more about the cultures within each one of them. For example, this one is the Great Horned Owl. This one is the Canyon Wren. And then as you get over here, this smaller one is considered to be the Butterfly Girl. Why is that important though? Each one of these is symbolic to something that would have existed in the nature around the individual tribes. And it was something that could have represented a god, or it could have represented something that they respected. And it could have been something that would help them to keep evil away from them. And so it's interesting to see how that they would portray each one of these through the color choices, especially knowing now that the colors were so important for so many things. Not to mention, it would also, through the face, what that face looked like if it used feathers. Each one of those pieces was a larger piece of the puzzle that would bring it all together. And so as we look at these, they look really cool. Yes, they look really interesting. Yes, but they are symbolic and they have a meaning that is far surpassing the ability to just look at it and visually be stimulated by the colors or the look. And I think that that's what's important is as you're drawn into something, you can see it for the surface, but then when you dive deeper, you learn so much more. And that's why museums like this are so important. So I encourage you guys to come out to this museum. And if you can't come to this museum, visit a museum about indigenous people in your area. You will learn so much. Brain wrinkles are so cool here. This one is considered to be the morning Katsina or Kachina. And then this one is the Buffalo or Second Mesa. See, each one of these very different, but each symbolizes something very important. You know how just a while ago we were talking about how they would have to extract the coloration from the plants? This is how they might have done that. These are certain things that they could have also used for pigment. And I think that it's kind of interesting to see how they would have derived pigment from various items in nature. And many of the colors that we see today in modern fashion started out with things just like this. Now this is actually really cool. In 1935, archeologists found these two bighorn sheep effigies. And they were at what's now the Yavapai County Fairgrounds and they were four and a half feet apart. So you can see from above what they looked like, but look at this. These are carvings that have very distinct big horns and they could definitely tell this was a big horn sheep. But who carved these and what were they for? Now, fun fact about these, they found a lot of bighorn sheep kinds of things like carvings, etchings, drawings in the Phoenix area. Now the Phoenix area is about 50 some odd miles away though. So why were they here? They question at this display, did the people from Phoenix somehow have an impact on the people from Prescott? Probably. A lot of the people who were in both areas tended to be a bit more nomadic, and so movement was not something that was unfounded within them. So it's very seriously an option that the people from Phoenix could have impacted either through their movement or also through their contributions, something that was happening all the way up here. Some other neat things on display here, you can find pottery discs. Now these are actually small discs that had holes drilled through them, and they were strung as ornaments. These could have been used for a variety of different things, but um, they could have been used for spindles in the case of this one here that's kind of sucked in at the middle. And then also you can see these larger ones, which are pulley or bead shaped spindles that were made of model clay. Now the last thing I want to share with you all is the importance of birds and culture. I think that that's also something that I found everywhere from Oklahoma down to Arizona and everything in between. Birds have been a predominant piece of indigenous culture no matter where I visited. And I think that it's fascinating that there's actually a display here. Now I'm gonna show you a few of these. Then we're gonna take a brief tour around with just some of the other things that I haven't shared with you that you guys need to see. And then we'll wrap this video up. Here we have a macaw in the background, and in front of that you see a prayer stick. The prayer stick actually uses the features of the macaw, the feathers, and cotton string, seed beads, and dew claws, and that would have been used in cultures probably in South America. There is a dual turkey-headed jar here, in addition to a great 
horned owl or mangua. And then as you kind of go through here, you also see a little seed pot with the crow mother and an engraved eagle bowl in the background. Like I said, birds are a big deal in culture. We also often would find references to eagles in artwork or in the petroglyphs. They would find them etched into different areas around camps. They would find many headdresses would use the feathers. And so because of this, birds were very important. And many of the different references that have historically been made have been in relation to birds. As I was leaving, I found this wonderful accessible archeological sites in the Prescott area brochure. So I'm gonna take this with me and potentially we could find some other really cool things here in the area. Places like this are absolutely amazing because they really do put together our pieces of history and teach us a newfound respect for those who are around us. I think it's very important for us to check out places like the Museum of Indigenous People and learn a little bit more about the world around us. It's really fun to get those brain wrinkles. And as we put together the pieces, from site to site, we grasp the bigger picture. Remember guys, we're not here for a long time, but we are here for a good time, and places like this definitely are that. Till next time guys, bye!